All right, let's talk about some of these different extinct species. So this graph has time on the x-axis with right up until now. We are the only species remaining out of all the species listed here. And way back uh, seven, six to seven million years ago is when the oldest species that are very recognizably on their way to being human first appear. But we're not going to worry about these very oldest species. Uh, we're only going to talk about two genuses, the Australopithecines, specifically Australopithecus afarensis, which is the species that is thought to have made those Laetoli footprints, and then a few of the direct ancestors. And you'll notice this, this graph is only about 10 years old, but I've had to add four more species here in our genus that have been discovered during that time since this graph was made. And we'll talk about two of these, uh, Homo floresiensis, which are also called the hobbits, the Denisovans, which don't even have an official species designation yet because we don't have a skull, and Homo naledi, which was discovered in Africa, and Homo luzonensis, which was discovered on the island of Luzon, uh, in the Pacific. Um, but new species continue to be discovered and re so human evolution is not a ladder as it was even Darwin kind of pictured it this way as ancestor evolving into ancestor, you know, leading directly to our species. Instead, it's this branching bush of uh, over 20 species now and we're the only surviving species on this branch. So here's our split way back here from chimps. And there's two species of chimpanzees, the common chimpanzee, uh, pan troglodytes, and uh, the, bon the bonobo chimps, pan paniscus. They're two distinct species, which that was, that's only been known for about 30, 40 years. Their divergence is much more recent, and they are equally distant from us. This is something that was debated for a long time because there's certain behavioral qualities that both of these species have. You know, in certain ways, the bonobo chimps seem more like us. In certain ways, the common chimpanzee seems more like us. But really, they're both equally genetically distant from us. So their common ancestor is only about one million years ago. Uh, we were way over here <laughs> by that point. And this thing down here that says cooperative aggression, the paper that I got this from, uh, that's one of the, the qualities of humans that they were interested in. And it evolved before the split of humans and chimps because chimps display cooperative aggression as well. So if we, so the way to look at this graph, so here we have time now is on the y-axis here. And this blue bar up at the very top, that's the last 200,000 years. So that's when our species was around. And so you see the little like thicker bars, that's when those species are known to have existed because we have fossil evidence for them. So our species, this black bar for our species has been around and then they just extended this as a blue bar going all the way across so that we can kind of see where other species overlapped with us. So two, here's two species that we're going to talk about, the Neanderthals, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, and uh, they've given them a species designation here, um, Homo denisova, but most people still just call them the Denisovans because we don't have a skull yet, we don't have a type specimen, we, it, they don't really have an official species name yet. And then you'll notice there's another one here, uh, Homo rodensiensis, uh, another African species, um, Luzonensis here, also overlapping with us, Homo floresiensis from the island of Flores overlapping with us. These mysterious people, the red deer cave people, who uh, we do have quite a few bones from them, but no DNA, they may actually be Denisovans. They, this is a population that lived in China very recently, clearly not our species, another species. Um, Homo erectus, 
persisted uh, up until about 100,000 years ago. So we can see here that besides our species, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the red deer cave people might actually be Denisovans. So at least seven different species within the genus Homo coexisting on the planet with our species. And yet we are the last survivors of this great diversity. So the question is then, one of the questions for anthropologists is, why? Did we out-reproduce them and out-compete them? Or did we kill them? That's, <laughs> that's the question. Okay, so here's the species that made those Laetoli footprints, scientists think. Australopithecus afarensis. And this the genus name here tells you where it was discovered. So Australo means southern. Pith is the root that is the Latin root for ape. So southern ape. Australopithecus, and that's because they were discovered in sub-Saharan Africa. And Afarensis refers to where they were first discovered. There's a valley called the Afar Valley in East Africa, and that's where they were first discovered. So Australopithecus, Afarensis. Um, this is an artist's impression of what they might have looked like. Of course, we don't really know how hairy or not hairy they were. That's one of the mysteries of the course of human evolution here is when we kind of know when being bipedal evolved because that's in the bones. Most of the fossil remnants that we have are just bones. So we don't really know when being mostly hairless and being really sweaty, we don't know when those things evolved because the skin is not preserved in the fossil record mostly, until quite recently. Um, but what we do know about them was they were they were fully bipedal, walked just like we do, but they had a fairly small brain, just a little bit bigger than a chimpanzee brain. They were pretty short, up to about four feet tall. Uh, we have bones from about 300 individuals, but they're too old for DNA, so no DNA. We don't have any DNA of anything older than a million years old, so this is way too old for DNA. This species never left Africa, at least that we can tell, because they're only found in Africa, although they were around for a long time, over a million years. So uh, they didn't make stone tools, but we think they probably did make tools, because chimpanzees even make tools. So. Uh, and they didn't use fire. There's no evidence of campfires, burning of uh, remains, burned bones, nothing like that. But because this was the very beginning of increase in brain size, and we also have evidence that uh, certain size mammals in Africa start to disappear around this time, around three million years ago, it's noticeable in the fossil record that certain size animals start to become more rare. And that's the thought, it's thought that that's because there was a new hunter on the scene uh, around three million years ago, and that would have been Australopithecus. Uh, we have one really complete skeleton of this species, which has been nicknamed Lucy. This is an artist rendition. This is from a museum, I think in Germany. Uh, of what they might have looked like. Females and males were very different in size for this species, much like chimpanzees and gorillas today. Chimpanzees and gorillas, males can be almost double the weight of the females. Uh, and that is not true for Homo sapiens, for our species. So that was another trend during the course of the evolution of all of our human ancestors, was that males and females started to become closer in size not as divergent in size or as dimorphic as the rest of the apes are. But you can see what passes for a really complete skeleton here because uh, uh, it, it's not a complete skeleton. This is the most complete one that we have. But we do have various bits of skeleton from about 300 individuals. And for um, primates and for human remains, the lower jaw and the upper jaw are the hardest bones in the body, and also the frontal part of the skull here is very hard. Um, also, the femurs 
are very hard. So those are the bones that we find the most uh, and teeth really hard. So a lot of the individuals that we have, we have a piece of lower jaw, piece of a skull, um, maybe a, a piece of the upper arm bone or a femur and nothing else. <laughs> so uh, the fact that we actually have some ribs which are very fragile, um, possibly a finger bone, uh, some little bits of three of the limbs. I mean, that's that's really a complete skeleton as for something that's three million years old. Homo habilis is the oldest member of our genus. It was named, uh, so homo means man. Habilis uh, is like toolmaker, your handyman. So originally, when this species was discovered, anthropologists were still under the impression that they were trying to figure out where during our evolution we started making tools. And we now know that chimpanzees make tools and probably all of our ancestors going all the way back to our ape split with chimpanzees, they probably all made tools. But when this fossil was first, when these fossils were first identified and the species was first named, they thought, aha, we finally have some tools associated with an ancestor. That means here's the tool maker. So that's what they named them. Uh, so this species lived around 2 million years ago and also didn't leave Africa. They did make stone tools, however, and we have those. Uh, and they hunted. They had um, a lot of animals as part of their diet. So uh, high nutrient density food. Um, so probably at this point, if they're hunting, you can see that the artist's rendition here has uh, him being mostly hairless. Uh, because we would figure by this point, the ability to run long distances in the heat would have already been well established. Brain size is larger, about 50% larger than Australopithecines, but still less than half of an average human today. Uh, longer arms and shorter legs than modern humans, but, but longer legs than the Australopithecines. So that trend continues, because of course, the longer your legs, the faster you can run. Homo erectus was a very successful species, uh, a little bit later than Homo habilis. This was the first uh, human ancestor to leave Africa. We find evidence of Homo erectus very far away from Africa, in India, in China, and on the island of Java. The famous fossils called Peking Man and Java Man, who may or may not have been male, because we only have skull bits, uh, those, and oh, I forget what the Indian, the first Indian specimen has a name too. I can't remember what it is. Um, but this species, uh, was very widespread, very successful within Africa and outside of Africa, slightly larger than Homo habilis, slightly larger brain than Homo habilis. And we finally find evidence of campfires and extensive fire use. And probably that meant cooked food. Because if you're using fire regularly, maybe not making fire, but using captured fire and preserving that fire like from lightning strikes and that, uh, cooked food is easier to digest. Uh, and again, we're trending towards using less energy for food digestion, more energy available for the brain. There's also more nutrients available and less toxins in plant foods if they're cooked. Um, this species was a little bit taller, uh, now getting into the same height as height range as modern humans, five to six feet tall. Uh, and they were around from about uh, two million years ago until quite recently. They overlapped significantly with our species up until about 70,000 years ago. Uh, this species is considered our most recent direct ancestor, Homo heidelbergensis, again named because the very first fossils of this species were discovered in near Heidelberg, Germany. Although this species evolved in Africa, they, are been, they have been found, remains have been found extensively in Africa and also in Europe and the Middle East. Um, they are considered the direct ancestor of both Neanderthals and us. So Neanderthals are no longer considered our direct ancestor. Um, this species was uh, would have been quite recognizable as being almost human. 
Um, they were around for about 200,000 years, so about as long as our species has been around. Uh, brain about the same size. Um, they were about uh, uh, five to six feet tall again. Uh, we start to see some evidence of culture with this species, burial of the dead with flowers, um, which is indicative that they must have had some kind of language. If you're burying your dead and you have cultural practices, you're sitting around a campfire cooking your food, they hunted a lot of large, dangerous herbivores, which would have meant probably a lot of cooperative hunting and communication. Um, and they also left Africa. They migrated out of Africa and they're found in Africa, in Europe, and in Asia. Their remains are found. Uh, Neanderthals are not considered our direct ancestor. They are considered another branch. They're uh, another descendant of Homo heidelbergensis. And these were ice age specialists. Um, they are, they evolved during an ice age and lived in extremely harsh conditions in Asia and in Europe. They are not found in Africa. No Neanderthals have been found in Africa, which isn't really a surprise because their, even their body type is a, are, includes adaptations to very cold weather. So you wouldn't think they would do very well if they had migrated back into Africa and found uh, other species that were better adapted to that, that climate. Um, so they have not been found in Africa. However, their DNA lives on because it, now that we have DNA sequencing and we have DNA of four Neanderthal individuals because their bones were well enough preserved. So uh, four Neanderthal individuals who died in the last 100,000 years, their remains are about 40,000 years old. We have DNA from them. Um, modern Europeans and Asians have some Neanderthal DNA, which indicates there was hybridization, which anthropologists have hypothesized about since the 1950s, that if we had two species of humans living in the same area, that probably they would have gotten together. And clearly that has actually happened. So if you're of Asian or European ancestry, you have about 1% to 4% Neanderthal DNA. And interestingly, a lot of that DNA, um, and it varies, it's not the same DNA in everybody. It's different genes in different groups of people. But a lot of it has to do with the immune system, which is really interesting. Um, so these individuals not only were using fire, they could make fire from scratch, which was another new skill. Uh, they made very complex tools. They um, did not use projectile weapons, though, like bows and arrows. Um, they probably couldn't throw very well either, judging by the shape of their elbows and their shoulders. They were very strong, but they probably couldn't throw a ball 20 feet. But they made very large, heavy-duty spears, and they probably killed the large animals that they hunted, like mammoths, by running up to them and stabbing them, which is quite a dangerous activity. And many of them, in fact, died of kind of severe bone breaks and injuries. They had very large brains. In fact, their brains are larger than ours per, if you measure by height, but they were also much more heavily boned than us. They were thicker and stockier than modern humans. Probably that's an, that's an adaptation to very cold weather. Um, they were um, entirely carnivorous at least part of the year because in the Ice Age winter, there would not have been any plants available to eat at least eight months of the year. Uh, and they went extinct approximately 35,000 years ago that we know of. So these are the, old, the oldest, or I should say the youngest fossil remains that we have are about 35,000 years old. But of course they could have survived a bit longer than that in isolated populations. And they did make clothing um, although, and maybe some rudimentary drawings, but they didn't make jewelry, they didn't make musical instruments, um, things that we associate with our species. And they also didn't change much. Uh, they were around for uh, about 200,000 years 
and their technology didn't really change at all. So the kind of spears that they made, the kind of tools that they made were about the same. They didn't show a lot of innovation in their tool making like you commonly see with our species. Um, another mysterious species that also lived around the same time, another species that was probably a direct descendant of Homo heidelbergensis and did not exist in Africa and probably evolved in Asia, um, is they're called the Denisovans because they don't have a proper species name yet, because although we do have a few bones from a cave in Siberia and one other location, there's no skull. And if you're going to name a new species, typically you have to, when you publish that, you have to have a type specimen. That type specimen has to include at least part of a skull, at least a piece of jaw or something. And that's one thing we don't have yet for Denisovans. Um, this is the cave where they were first discovered. It's in Siberia, and it was supposed to be the home of some um, medieval hermit named Dennis. <laughs> so that's why the the kev the cave is the is Dennis the cave of Dennis, and uh, so that's why they're called Denisovans after this this cave, which is a tourist attraction. Um, you can go there and see the cave in uh, Siberia. I don't know what big city it's near. And interestingly, um, these bones yielded DNA. So we have DNA from several individuals of this species, uh, including the very first one was uh, from a 41,000 year old finger bone. And it turned out that individual was a female. Since then, other individuals have been identified by DNA. Unfortunately, no skull yet. And it turns out they are a distinct species, just as distantly related from Neanderthals and modern humans. So these three species that probably all branched from Homo heidelbergensis, our species in Africa, Neanderthals and Denisov Neanderthals probably in Europe, Denisovans probably in Asia, and all three species ended up converging in approximately the same area. And interestingly, just like for Neanderthals, there are modern humans who have Denisovan DNA. People from Melanesia, which is just north of Australia, and Australian uh, Aboriginal peoples have about 6% Denisovan DNA. So that's really interesting, too. And I don't know what genes are involved. Like for the Neanderthal DNA, a lot of the DNA is has to do with the immune system. Um, I heard one little tidbit about this um, that had to do with um, Tibetans specifically have Denisovan DNA, and it is specifically in the genes that give them their adaptation to high altitude. So that's kind of an interesting tidbit, although um, uh, Tibetan native peoples are neither Melanesians nor Australian Aborigines, but yet they have Denisovan DNA too. So at least three species of our genus Homo were running around Europe and Asia simultaneously, and there was at least two species in Africa at the same time, our species, and there's another species um, that's been discovered recently, Homo naledi, that was in South Africa at the same time as our species. They're extinct now as well. And there's at least one other species as well who's only known from DNA in modern humans. Just like, so we don't find uh, Denisovan DNA or Neanderthal DNA in modern Africans, but we do find DNA from yet another species in small percentages. Again, so um, it's, we have an interesting history. So here's another extinct species. Uh, which was discovered recently, Homo floresiensis. It was discovered on the island of Flores in Indonesia in 2003. They're nicknamed the hobbits because they're really small. They're about three feet tall, which is exactly the size of hobbits <laughs> Lord of the Rings, although they weren't as smart as hobbits because they had a pretty small brain. The first one that was discovered um, when the scientists who discovered it tried to report it as a new species, everybody said, oh, no, it's not. It's you know, some diseased individual who had a really small brain and, you know, but then they found eight more. So uh, it was clearly a species. They were not modern humans because they're, um, they're, they're just way too small. It's now thought that they're dwarf Homo erectus. So we do know that Homo erectus made it all the way to what's now Indonesia. 
Um, they crossed the Wallace line, which if you remember from evolution, you know, Wallace was the other guy who came also, also came up with natural selection. And there's a line that's in through the, the islands in the Pacific there that species don't seem to be able to cross because there was never a land bridge during the ice ages. But this species, so Homo erectus, managed to cross that line. And that means they had to have some kind of a boat or raft technology to do that because you can't, it's seven miles of open ocean. There's no way that they swam across seven miles of open ocean. So that tells us that although, you know, we tend to think Homo erectus probably weren't very smart because they had such a small brain compared to ours, um, well, they did manage to build a raft or boat of some kind and cross the Wallace Line to colonize Flores Island. And we don't know how long ago they went extinct. The skeletons are have been variously dated at 18,000 years old, 50,000 years old, and 80,000 years old, depending on the scientists studying them. But when the scientists first discovered these remains in a cave, they talked, you know, of course, they're always using local guides. And the local village said, oh, we know who they are. Those are the Ibugogo. And my grandmother saw one and they used to come into the village and they didn't wear any clothes and they couldn't speak. And they would come in and put their hands out and, and we would give them food and, to make them go away. So there are all these local stories about these short people who didn't wear clothes and couldn't speak. Um, but nope, that he couldn't find anybody living who'd actually seen one. All the people, it was always like my grandmother, my aunt, somebody who was dead was the one who had seen them. So it's quite possible that they went extinct rather recently, maybe in the last thousand years, and the stories have survived. So that's another interesting little tidbit. Flores is, of course, tropical, which means that remains don't preserve very well. So it's quite possible that they were around for a long time and they just weren't preserved. Um, they're a dwarf species. Island dwarfism is a phenomenon that's very well known. There was also a species of dwarf elephants that lived on Flores Island and remains have been found in the same cave of butchered dwarf elephants. So here's a modern human for comparison. That's how little they were. And small head. So clearly, you know, not our species, probably a dwarf Homo erectus. There was also a dwarf species of elephant um, that's also been extinct for at least a thousand years. And there's evidence in the cave that this species uh, were uh, killing and butchering the dwarf elephants that lived on the island as well. So very interesting story. People are um, continuing to look for new kinds of remains. They were only preserved where they were found because it's a limestone drip cave. So there's constantly this dripping from the ceiling, which dripped on the bones and kind of uh, mummified them and preserved them. Otherwise, in a, in a wet tropical area, everything just tends to decay and not fossilize. So uh, three species of our genus have left Africa. Um, the first to leave was Homo erectus, and we now know Homo erectus, well, Homo erectus made it to Europe, or, or um, the Middle East, not all the way into Europe. They haven't been found in Europe. Uh, Homo erectus made it to what's now eastern China, and they made it all the way to um, what's now um, Indonesia, and all the way to Flores Island because that's probably the ancestor of the Homo floresiensis. They were probably a species of Homo erectus or a um, evolved from Homo erectus. The second to leave Africa was Homo heidelbergensis. This species is our direct ancestor. They have been found in Europe and in the Middle East and Western parts of China. That's as far as they've been found. Nothing in eastern China, but that doesn't mean they weren't there. We just haven't found the remains yet. Um, and then lastly, our species, which again left Africa around, there's remains of our species in uh, the Middle East from 
90 to 100,000 years ago. So that's when we started to leave Africa. And our species was well established outside of Africa by 50,000 years ago. All, our species had made it all the way to Australia by 45,000 years ago and made it to North and South America by 20,000 years ago. Um, so when I come back, I will come back in the next video and talk a little bit about mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosomes, and the competing hypotheses for the evolution of our species in Africa. And what's the evidence for that? Thank you.